Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure of discussing one of the great topics of biology, which is uh, the field of classification, uh, the study of phylogeny, and through systematics. So all of that is sort of trying to piece together uh, using taxonomy, organizing, naming organisms, uh, trying to figure out the tree of life. Now, what is that? Well, I mean, if you can imagine a big, beautiful oak tree and with all of its branches, um, all sort of uh, radiating out from a common trunk. And so from a common ancestor, all living things have diverged into all the great species of the world. And that, that's what this is kind of be uh, about, an introduction to phylogeny. And so take a look at this creature. What do you make of it? If you were looking at this you're like whoa look out it looks like a scary snake but in fact it's not a scary snake it's a scary looking lizard <laughs> and so you know what makes um, something a snake what makes something a lizard what makes something a mammal um, how do we classify these things and so it's this sort of legless lizard look that looks like a snake but you know here's why not why not a snake uh, more generally Here's the bigger question. How do we distinguish and categorize the millions of different species on the planet Earth? And it's like, don't don't hate on me because uh, I don't have legs. Uh, so this that's what the eastern uh, lizard is saying right here. So this eastern glass lizard, uh, you know, what? well, why isn't it a snake? Let me see if I can address that, though not a specialist in classification of lizards. Uh, it doesn't have mobile jaws, it doesn't have a large number of vertebrae, it doesn't have um, a short tail just outside of its anus, which are all sort of shared characteristics that snakes have. So, it, so it's not considered to be a snake. So phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species and groups of related species. So we're looking at a tree and we're going back in time and we're trying to piece together, sort of like uh, an investigator trying to figure out relationships, evolutionary relationships, who's more closely related to who and how far back does a common ancestor need to go that is shared with all of these things. Like for example, you know, think about it. So the snakes over here have no limbs. Okay, as opposed to the gecko uh, or, or, or a traditional lizard like a monitor lizard over here. So this eastern glass lizard um, sort of on its own developed the no limb. So separately from the snake because there isn't a direct uh, descendant from snakes and eastern uh, ancestor from snakes and eastern uh, glass lizards. They do all the way back have a common ancestor right there. Let me, let me go back to this. So back here, there was a common ancestor, of course, with the lizards. Uh, but here they evolved separately. And what does this mean? So, and how do we know this? Well, most of our knowledge of phylo phylogeny is based on DNA sequences. And in particular, DNA sequences in regions that code for uh, ribosomal RNA, because those, uh, those change rather slowly and can be used for a long period of time. So DNA sequence is what we're basing this on. And so we know that the, the, the limbs, uh, the no limbs evolved independently and we call that sort of a convergent evolution and we'll talk a little bit further about that. So uh, in evolutionary biology, convergent evolution is whereby organisms that are not closely related, in other words, in that same monophyletic uh, group that I was showing just a moment ago that are sort of outside of that evolved similar traits. In other words, the no limbs basically because they are needing to uh, adapt to a similar environment or a similar ecological niche. Now it's not by intention, it's, it's through the process of natural selection of course. So this discipline of systematics is classifies organisms and it determines their evolutionary relationships. And so this is kind of interesting. We could sort of see how more closely related the humpback whale is to the blue whale versus not as much to the mink whale so, or fin whale. So we can look at these kinds of things. And, and again, 
they're they're useful for uh, individuals that are studying uh, phylogeny. And so systematics will these in, scientists will use these kinds of tools like DNA sequencing. Uh, they will look at uh, fossils and all sorts of uh, taxonomic characteristics, morphological traits to consider who's more similar to to who. And mostly though, these days, molecular and genetic data to infer the evolutionary relationships because when it really gets down to it, molecular meaning if you have more similar amino acids in a particular protein, you're more closely related. And of course, the ultimate is if your DNA sequences are more closely aligned, then you're more similar. But historically, we didn't have that kind of uh, data to go on. We had like fossils and morphological. But there's all kinds of taxonomic characteristics, characteristics that we can use. And so when I say morphological, let me, let me explain that a little bit more and not assume. That means it's sort of the general external appearance of organisms. So it's kind of like if you think about it, if you have drawers at home and you're putting like rubber bands in one drawer and metallic things in another one and plastic things in another one, you're looking at external morphology. Uh, such things as like specialized structures could be used, like the genitalia of organisms. And then if you went internally to, to sort of characterize individuals, you can look at anatomy. Or you could look at embryology, how similar the embryonic uh, journey is. Uh, karyotypes can be used. And then physiological things such as uh, metabolic factors, body secretions could be analyzed. And then molecular, and let me, let me do a shout out for molecular molecular characteristics because this is our go-to these days and so what's fascinating is that there's a long history of phylogeny and classification in evolutionary biology but it but it also there's nothing more recent in the study of biology because we're now using amino acid sequence and our and a DNA sequences uh, in order to determine relationships uh, between organisms. You can even look at behavioral characteristics to see how similar they are, or ecological characteristics, or ge geographic. Kind of interesting. So taxonomy basically is that sort of that ordered division of naming uh, organisms, and it's the branch of science that encompasses sort of the description, the identification, the nomenclature that goes along with that, of classifying organisms. And so let's kick this around. Um, you may be familiar with this individual, not maybe not visually, but you may have heard of the name Linnaeus. So uh, Linnaeus in the 18th century, can you believe it, published a system that uh, we're still somewhat using uh, in phylogenetics, the taxonomy based basically on morphological characteristics. And so this binomial nomenclature, maybe you're, maybe you're familiar with it, uh, Systematics have considered the kingdom in the past as being the highest taxonomic character. And back in this day, in Linnaeus, he figured things to be fairly organized. And so you're either going to be in the, an animal, what are you, are you an animal or you're a plant? <laughs> so there's two kingdoms. And so one, and I just want to, I don't mean to be like, you know, jesting too much about that, but I want to emphasize the point that uh, maybe it's kind of punny, but taxonomy has been evolving, systematics has been evolving as well, and so it's, it's, it's subject to change and improvement. So, I mean, bacteria with their rigid walls were originally thought to be like more plant-like than animal-like in the plant kingdom. Fungi that, that didn't photosynthesize and shared little with green plants, but yet were classified in the plant kingdom. Uh, things that sort of were photosynthetic but yet moved were claimed by both zoologists and botanists. So there, there's always been some controversy and some arguments on, on where things should be put. So, in the, so briefly, 1969 uh, emerges this five kingdom system where we have kingdom Monera of, for prokaryotes, things like bacteria. Then we have protists, okay? Uh, all, largely single-celled organisms, uh, eukaryotic though, sort of like the protus is sort of like the junk drawer. <laughs> it's like anything that we don't think is a plant or fungi or an animal is a, is a protus. So there's plants, fungi, and animals, so the five kingdoms. But things are still changing. So the, the key features of the Linnaeus system remain though, which is 
that sort of that final two part naming system hierarchy of classification uh, binomial the first part is genus you might be familiar with that genus and the second part is a specific epithet that is unique for each species within the genus and then some subtleties but yet important the genus is always capitalized and the species is italicized and so when you put them together uh, for example you always use both the binomial so it's genus and species Esterichii coli or E dot coli um, and this hierarchy doesn't just have genus and species but rather it goes all the way up and when Linnaeus introduced it we're still using this uh, today where now we've introduced the concept of domain above kingdom so it's sort of a super kingdom and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a moment but we have domain kingdom phylum class order family genus and species and so there's a hierarchy going from broad down to most specific and so here you have these three domains you have domain bacteria domain arch archaea um, archaea and eukarya so what these domains are are the largest groupings and then within the domain of eukaryota so the all things being eukaryotes you have the kingdom of animals you have the kingdom of plants uh, that sort of thing and so if you if you go all the way up to the to the leopard uh, you would go kingdom phylum so it's so it's phylum chordata class mammalia order carnivora and so you would find your way going all the way up until you get into genus right there and species and so that's the binomial um, system of naming genus and species the, the common name even though we're sometimes comfortable with the common name means different things to different people in different places and so we can call something uh, and can be confused if we use common names and so we like to go with the with this taxonomic genus and species binomial system because it leaves no doubt and it's international and so there's each I just wanted to point out each tax, taxonomic unit at any hierarchical level is a, is considered to be a taxon okay so that's what if you if you're familiar with that and so you know there's many animals uh, there's uh, quite a quite a few animals in phylum chordata there's several uh, uh, animals found within class mammalia and again eventually you would narrow it down until until you see the leopard like that and so that's what we're working with and so this five kingdom system recognizes that there's really a basic fundamental difference between uh, monarins which are uh, prokaryote and then these are the eukaryotes the protist plants fungi and animals um, but however these days um, arranging the the diversity of life is always work in progress and so it's always evolving as I said earlier and so when you apply our most recent molecular data to this we see that there's some challenges between um, the the previous classification scheme and so it led to this three domain system where we have bacteria archaea and eukarya um, and so this three system suggests that DNA sequences have the eukaryotes animals for which we belong more closely related to the eukarya uh, domain than the bacteria so that's kind of interesting so linking classification and phy phylogeny so systematics depends on these evolutionary relationships and we can make these trees so we could look at various branch points like this between organisms and say and study the the evolutionary history and so it represents a hypothesis and you know what does that mean well we're always changing this based on the data that we collect of, about evolutionary relationships so it's we're never really fully confident of this tree of life and so here you can see it branching out here you can see here's the order there's many different um, members of the carnivora order and then these are the different families and genus here and then various species and here you can see the gray wolf the common name is referred as uh, canis lupus so genus and species capitalized and then italics for both now let's talk a little bit about what the 
phylogenetic tree looks like and what and what we can make of this. And so we have this sort of rooted tree includes the branching that represents common ancestries in the tax in the taxa of in the tree. So here's the ancestral lineage lineage of or the ancestral organism. This is basically at this node right here, right there at this node, uh, represents the common ancestor for all of these. So A through G, this was the common ancestor right here, and that's what, that's what we're meaning by that. So it all goes all the way back. And so each branch point uh, represents a divergence in the two evolutionary lineages from a common ancestor. So this would be the common ancestor here. This would be a common ancestor to, let me erase, let me erase this. So this would be a common ancestor here to A, B, and C, okay? And sister taxa uh, share an immediate common ancestor, meaning like right here. So these would be considered sister taxa. Just some terms. Uh, a basal, so at, a, at the bottom, represents the divergence uh, in, in really further back in history, early diverge early in history and originated near the common ancestor of everyone in the group. That's the basal taxon, which would be represented with G. A polytomy is a branch from which there's more than two emerging uh, groups, like D and F, like right here. Do you see? Here is a polytomy right here where there's D through F. So D, E, and F come from this branch point right there instead of just the two. So what can we learn? What can we not know from phylogenetic trees? Well, they show a pattern of descent, but they're not necessarily always phenotypically similar sometimes, but they do show patterns of descent. And we can't assume that that members of a taxon evolved from a taxon next to it. In other words, like when you go back here, B and C did, did not evolve from each other, but rather they share a common ancestor. That's an important point. Okay. Um, so just to conclude, uh, Charles Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace, they sure had it right when they demonstrated um, the concept of natural selection and the origin of species th through adaptive radiation. And so this, this reality of divergence uh, through time and common ancestry is is being worked out in the study of phylogeny okay so in phylogenetics so i hope you enjoyed this brief look at phylogenetics thanks for watching